Thank you, guys. You thought I would be, uh, you, uh, you know, I'm back. So you thought you would be dis I would be disappear, but no. Uh, I'm back, and I'm going to talk a bit more about uh, mobile payment uh, in China, and also the differences between China and Southeast Asia. So obviously today we've, we've, we've seen a lot of things about open, open banking, open insurance. This is a, a much lighter uh, theme in terms of like uh, content. Hopefully uh, it will be interesting for you. Don't hesitate to ask questions along the way. Uh, happy to answer. OK, so if you've been to China recently, and in, re in recently, I mean the past two years, uh, you've seen that some of the places uh, to purchase things um, in China are uh, pretty much uh, cashless. Um, and um, from that coffee shop, for example, on the top right, um, or that uh, um, dumpling shop uh, on, the, on the bottom left, it's only uh, QR code payments, um, and that's virtually everywhere in uh, tier one cities, actually, uh, and tier two and tier three cities more and more, uh, where we can obviously use that uh, means of payment. This is about 54% um, of, um, uh, of payments uh, in China. Um, there's still a lot of cash uh, involved, but we're, we're saying that um, this is going cashless. And out of those third party payments, as you know, Alipay and WeChat Pay are the dominant uh, giants. But the story is a lot different in Southeast Asia, and, and this is what I, I wanted to share with you, um, more of like the trends and developments of what's happening it, with the e-wallet or third-party payments um, in Southeast Asia. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through a, a, a few countries, see what are, what are the trends, and, and probably try to um, dig out some things that uh, we can see in the future. So for example, in Indonesia, uh, Tokopedia launched uh, uh, Dana uh, as an e-wallet um, uh, recently. Um, interestingly, Dana is backed up by, by End Financial, uh, which is Alibaba. Um, and this, is, this has been a, a, a growing strategy for ch Chinese tech giant Alibaba to branch out of China and invest in a lot of different uh, fintech products uh, and payment products. Dana is one of them, and, um, and we are sure going to count on this one in the next future. Uh, Go, GoPay from Gojek is also uh, one of the payments that we can count on um, and, uh, in, the near, in the near future. However, as you can see, card is still a, a huge uh, means of payment, um, and, uh, you know, and that's not going to change for the, the next year or year and a half. In Vietnam, the story is different. As you can see, cash is, uh, has the, the, the lion's share uh, of mobile payments and, and, you, uh, and payments in general. Um, <laughs> cash has yeah, dominant share. Um, first of all, when, you, when you're uh, in Vietnam, Lazada is one of the, you know, one of the main uh, uh, e-commerce platform there. Uh, it's all cash on delivery. Uh, it's, uh, it's, 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 no, uh, there's, there, it's a given that if you are a Lazada provider, you will uh, get cash on delivery. But there are some other uh, platforms that are coming up, um, like Momo, for example. Uh, Momo has had a significant growth in Vietnam in the past, uh, in the past uh, five, six years. Uh, it's got 10 million users uh, already, uh, 100,000 stores, uh, and you can virtually pay for, for, for everything, including uh, obviously your ticket airlines from Vietnam Airlines, um, uh, the bus, the, uh, the metro, everything. So really copying the model of Alibaba and WeChat. It, but interestingly, even though it looks very, very similar uh, to WeChat uh, and Alibaba in terms of like, user experience, user interface, it is not backed up by any of those tech giants, and Alibaba and, and WeChat hasn't, haven't gone into Vietnam uh, uh, too much um, in terms of fin finance, um, in, in terms of investment. So that's very interesting because uh, at the moment, it's a, uh, Vietnam is in silo, um, running things internally in Vietnam, uh, developing new, uh, uh, new products for payments, uh, but we're going to see that they're going to be uh, under attack in some way from, from tech giants. Malaysia uh, is another one. GrabPay uh, is obviously, uh, as, you, as you all know, uh, the, the major one. But Card is a significant, has a significant share. Um, okay, so here, um, 
paradox, uh, it's, it's kind of a paradox because the reason why QR code payment and, and mobile payment was uh, so successful in China was because, um, because of trust. Alibaba implemented Alipay to solve the trust issue um, for payments. Um, and this is the very reason why the card here is so prevalent is because people are trusting more the banks than the e-wallet. So it's kind of the opposite. Uh, but some people say, um, and rightfully so, uh, that the card is actually less secure or could be less secure uh, than a QR code or than a third party provider. Um, obviously, if, you, if your card gets stolen, you know, the, the, pay, the, the, the pay wave uh, thing can, can, can work without a code. Uh, on your phone, you always need to uh, put your finger uh, or, or even your, your face now. So, so it's, that's kind of a paradox, and, and it, it shows how fragmented and different the market is across different countries. Um, in Thailand, um, so beside Grab and Lazada, um, there are some, a lot of local players um, like uh, Rabbit, Rabbit Line Pay, for example, uh, where you can pay for Metro, you can pay for a lot of different things uh, with Rabbit uh, Line Pay, um, but also very different from all of the other countries and very fragmented across all those different countries. And this is the biggest, uh, the, the biggest uh, impact uh, or the, the biggest difference between Southeast Asia and China. Um, it, the QR code has been uh, so successful in China for, for many reasons. And if you were here yesterday in the first session, um, the first speaker talked about the QR code and why it was so successful, why it provided uh, cost-effective uh, solutions um, and also scalability. Uh, compared to other means of payment like, uh, like NFC, for example, there's no doubt QR code has uh, a lot of good days uh, um, in, in front of them. So, uh, yeah, why is QR code payment uh, so different? But first of all, when you go to China, as we said, there's QR codes everywhere, like literally everywhere. <laughs> and it's, it's sometimes a, a bit overwhelming. That's a, a job post, for example. Uh, but they're really everywhere, right? <laughs> uh, tattoo and uh, in, in different, different uh, places. You know, uh, that's a panda, right? <laughs> so that's in Chengdu, um, in, in, the, in one of the panda reserve. So they're really literally everywhere. <laughs> uh, that's in a, a small village um, in China uh, where the, the local farmers uh, made a, a QR code out of a um, uh, well, different stuff, obviously, but <laughs> um, and it works. It works. It directed to the website of the local town to advertise about all the different uh, uh, touristic and sightseeing uh, um, uh, capabilities. Uh, so the question is, can the region replicate or duplicate that, that uh, model or that, that successful model? Grab is the one that is actually the, the first one that it was the first one to say we need to break habits uh, into everyday lives uh, into, into making sure that the QR code as a mean of payment is, uh, is, is becoming dominant and prevalent. So, uh, and it's from really the day-to-day -day, um, uh, stuff, like buying uh, a bottle of water in, in 7-Eleven or uh, buying the, the metro tickets or paying for, for, for the, the taxi, etc. So, they are implementing this, uh, but breaking habits is obviously uh, very hard. So, that's why there is some governmental initiatives. Um, you've probably seen that um, for... Uh, it was implemented uh, a year and a half, two years ago already, the Singapore QR code, SGQR. So this is very interesting because this QR code gather all the different means of payments um, that you could have uh, into one QR code. So if you're using FavPay, for example, or if you like to use LiquidPay or, or DBS or whatever app that you use to pay with a QR code, you could actually use that QR code. But it's not because it's everywhere in uh, those little shops that we use every day that the habits becomes you know, a, a true habit. One of, one of the reasons is because in order to have this QR code linked to all those different uh, merchants, one store needs to agree on a, a partnership 
with all the different one-to-one -one partnership with all the different merchants. So that means as a 7-Eleven, they have to agree on uh, paying through uh, FastPay, LiquidPay, and all of this. So if your favorite QR code payment is not part of those one-to-one uh, -one partnership with the merchants, then it's useless. So it was, a, it was a really good idea, and it's still a good idea, but it still requires a lot of effort from sales team and from uh, you know, merchants to actually sell the fact that they're going to be on the QR code. Um, in Thailand, say, uh, very similar uh, with our prompt pay, it's, uh, it's, it's a bank initiative. Uh, and it, what's, what's, what is uh, very interesting is that they, uh, it comes from a bank, it's not, co it's not coming from a third party provider, so that means the infrastructure uh, is also, uh, well, in, in terms of uh, um, speed, is also uh, becoming a, a lot better. Um, and and that's, that's potentially the way forward, having one QR code uh, for all the different means of payment. So what does that mean in terms of API? Um, so we've seen, obviously, for the past two days, a lot of great things about uh, API management um, through different, uh, different platforms, uh, such as Tyke, for example, who, uh, who provides amazing uh, API management. And uh, for example, microservices, um, serverless, uh, containerization, all of this uh, becomes really, really interesting when we talk about uh, API management for WeChat Pay. And this is what I'm gonna, uh, I want to spend a, a few minutes on WeChat Pay and how it uh, enabled a lot of merchants, a lot of companies um, getting paid faster, uh, a lot faster. And for a brand, there's many ways. We, only, we always think about the QR, the QR code payment, right, when we talk about WeChat Pay, but actually there's, uh, there's the, the, the Quick Pay on the website itself, um, where, or sorry, in a, in, a, in a shop, for example, where you actually show the QR code to the, to the, to the cashier, and they scan you. It's not you scanning. Um, it's also uh, when you're on, the, on your phone directly, uh, just going through, WeChat, going through WeChat and paying through the WeChat. There's no QR code involved. But that requires a lot of different user experience, and we're going to see that in a, in a, in a moment. Um, also, WeChat Pay APIs, really well documented. They, they are the ones, they are the payment gateway uh, that have the most well documented APIs in the market. They are both in Chinese and in English. And um, I don't know if uh, David from uh, Be My Guest is here, uh, but uh, he's got a, he was telling me a, a lot about his team working with China um, for API documentation. And that was really interesting, because, really inspiring, because basically uh, a team in China working on APIs will work with a Chinese uh, way of, of, uh, of documenting, and that's basically unreadable for anybody else uh, outside of China. So WeChat Pay uh, and WeChat in general has made it available, documentation available for all developers in the world to actually understand and have this documentation well documented. So kudos to them. Um, and so the, uh, the, the payment infrastructure, uh, obviously very simple. Um, uh, we're going to see that, uh, first, the documentation is good. Second, the UX is, is very different. And if you, have, uh, if you have been on a mini program, we're going to talk about this, WeChat mini program, or a website for China, uh, or targeting Chinese users, you'll see that the user experience is very different. And it puts the user experience at the center of everything in terms of payment and how it is very, very simple. Um, traditionally, um, because we are a service provider and we, do, uh, we provide a lot of e-commerce solutions, with our Chinese customers, the funnel for actually going from choosing the product to actually paying for it, uh, it's never more than three clicks. And we advise our companies uh, to have this kind of user journey very, very fast because the decision-making process is very fast. And with our European clients, for example, um, things are a lot, more, uh, a lot different. And sometimes the user journey on the website is a lot, a lot longer in terms of uh, the decision-making process or the decision-buying process. So that means... Um, payment is less of a, an issue, for example, on European e-commerce web e website than it is on, on the Chinese uh, website, and how the payment is at the center of everything within the Chinese, uh, a Chinese um, uh, product. 
I've got a bit of a tip for you as well because um, all the WeChat uh, documentation uh, is available uh, internationally but usually uh, developers, so this is for the geekiest of, uh, amongst us, right? Uh, uh, usually international uh, developers that are not Chinese, if they look for uh, WeChat modules or WeChat pay module online, they will not find anything. So if you go on GitHub, oh no, it doesn't, yes, it's here. Uh, look for Weixin, Weixin Pay, or even WX Pay. Weixin is the, is the Chinese name of WeChat. Uh, as simple as that, right? Uh, but you'll get a lot more documentation, a lot more code uh, shared because it's open source as well. And, and there you go, you'll have a lot more documentation. Okay, so um, a very quick word on for companies. Uh, I get a lot of questions here of, I'm a company here in Singapore, uh, but I want to target Chinese users. I want to target Chinese consumers. How can I do this uh, on WeChat? if I have a, bi a business license or if I don't have a business license in China. Um, so uh, there's actually two ways, right? Either you have a business license already in China and you can ac accept local WeChat payment or basically uh, WeChat can also allow cross-border uh, cross WeChat payment allow with APIs, uh, provi providing APIs to do that. Um, the partnership with the banks, are obviously, in different countries are really important, and this is what we need to check already first, but definitely available. And the application process is very, uh, very straightforward. Uh, you, you make the application, sign the contract, and either you have a merchant with an I, uh, a merchant ID in China, that's great, or we create um, that, that uh, partner ID within China to make sure that we are able to open uh, uh, an account. Okay, another tip for you. Um, there's this company called Upay in, uh, in China. It's been very successful, and it's, it's, uh, it's the stripe of uh, payment gateways in, in China, right? I, I put it like, uh, like this. Uh, but it's, it's, it's essentially what it does is it gather all the different uh, payments, uh, gateways in, in China into one payment. And it's very, very interesting for uh, foreign companies to accept and to accept payments in China uh, without having um, business license. Uh, what what UPay does is uh, open open the APIs. Uh, they have a full platform. Uh, they obviously the drawback is that they take a commission. It, it, it can it can get a little pricey, but super convenient obviously for a lot of. Uh, I we have no share in this, so uh, so just just sharing this. Okay, a few uh, case studies. Um, so uh, this one is interesting because Galerie Lafayette, for, it's a huge department store in, in uh, Paris, and they also opened in, in, in Beijing recently. And in Paris, they um, have accepted WeChat payment for a while uh, because, it was, because the majority of the tourists, uh, being Chinese, went to Galerie Lafayette and wanted to pay with WeChat Pay and nothing else. They were losing a lot of, a lot of uh, customers. They had to adapt. Um, the fact that WeChat accepted, so it was kind of a one-to-one -one partnership with, uh, with Tencent itself, accepted to open this internationally for Galerie Lafayette was a really a, a, a changing kind of practice and, and followed a lot of different, um, di different uh, areas or places in Paris that could, uh, that could do this as well, the Eiffel Tower, um, and then in the UK as well, Harrods, etc. So by doing this, um, it's, it allows Tencent to go outside of China and, and, br and branch out through Chinese travelers who want to use their own solutions. And this practice, we can see that is going to be, um, what we believe is that uh, it's going to be the main practice for local uh, merchants here in Southeast Asia Vietnam, Singapore, etc., branching out to other countries and, and doing those one-to-one -one partnership with stores and banks to make sure that your favorite QR code app is available in those different countries. Uh, Estée Lauder is also uh, another example. Uh, Estée Lauder is, uh, is one of many brands uh, or who is doing this on their 
desktop website. I know it's a bit old now, but still, um, for example, you can't pay, if you want to pay with WeChat on a desktop, it's, it's possible. It will just display the QR code. You just have to scan with your phone, and then and there you go. You, have, you, you, you pay. So it's as simple as that, and it's a, a lot more trustworthy in a way than, than many other uh, pay, uh, different kind of payments. I wanted to talk to you about this uh, company as well, Xiao Hongshu, uh, Little Red Book, because uh, it's been uh, listed publicly last year, around August. Uh, it's one of the startups that is actually exploding in China in terms of like users. Um, and the way they've done it is, I mean, uh, the, the Little Red Book is specialized in fashion uh, uh, accessories, um, and uh, it's a social network as well as an e-commerce platform. So it's, it's really embedded into different kind of practice. There's a lot of video, live streaming videos where you can see someone putting on clothes and buying directly uh, on the fly uh, using WeChat Pay, for example. But what they've done is that they've uh, multiplied their channels across uh, all the different kind of apps that were available, super apps. So for example, they've got their own app, they've got their own website, but they've got also their WeChat mini program uh, where you can only pay with WeChat Pay because everything else is, is blocked. But still, the front end is, uh, is, is part of the Tencent code, developed uh, by, with the Tencent code. The back end stays the same across, um, across the app, the website, the mini program, or any other channels, right? Headless, using APIs, and making sure that uh, uh, the payments are running through the same back end system. Um, on the, other, on the other platform, for example, if you go on their app, you will be able to pay with Alipay, you will be able to pay with cards, etc. But interestingly, on, mini, on the WeChat mini program, you can only pay with WeChat. This is also the rules of, of Tencent. OK, key takeaways. Um, so basically, uh, this reaching uh, the end of this talk, uh, QR code payment uh, is becoming a standard. Um, and we're going to see it more and more, and we better start using it uh, individually because otherwise we're, we're going to get uh, lost very quickly. Uh, and APIs plays obviously a vital role in the integration of QR code payments, but, but the biggest change that we need to have uh, is on the consumption habits. Actually, that's the e-wallet providers that say that we need to change, but it's, it's, it's certainly something that is going to change, and if the, the, the fastest we embrace that change, um, the sooner, I mean, the sooner the better, basically. So that's it for me. Thank you very much for your attention, um, and I think we've got a great speaker coming up as well. Thank you. Thanks, Adrian. Thanks.